Hello and welcome to q and I'm Jay Nordlinger, and this episode is brought to you by Ladder for Life Insurance and X-Chair for First Class Sitting. I'll have more to say about our sponsors later in the show. Our guest today is BHL, as he is widely known, Bernard-Henri Lévy, the French philosopher and writer. He has authored many books of various natures. The latest is The Will to See, Dispatches from a World of Misery and Hope. It is a collection of dispatches, as the subheading tells you. It is also filled with philosophical, political, personal, and other reflections. The Will to See is a beautiful and thought-provoking book, and its author joins us from his home in Paris. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Happy to be with you. Thank you so much. I, I thought we might begin at the beginning, namely with the title of your book, The Will to See. I imagine that this title was not chosen casually. Uh, would you tell us about its meaning? Uh, it's um, for a philosopher, it's a um, very important precision. I have the will to know, I have the will to build the concepts, I have the will to reflect, but I have also the will to go to things and to and to see them properly concretely with my my soul spirit but also with my body i want to involve my body in this adventure in this enterprise of seeing being testimony for the things the real things well you're sitting in a beautiful personal library right now but you don't want to spend your whole life there you insist on putting yourself into danger. Uh, do you see some connection between philosophy and this reporting you do? Or do you feel the need to be a man of action as well as a man of thought? I think that my, my original project is probably to be a man of action as well as, as a man of thought. And um, when I was a young man, I dreamt of uh, being, uh, I don't know, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Lord Byron, uh, uh, André Malraux, as much as Michel Foucault or Jacques Derrida. My dream, my project, my models, my intimate uh, uh, heroes were um, doers, doers, people who did, who acted, as much as philosophers. Nevertheless, my way to see is certainly influenced and shaped by my, my uh, philosophical skill, by my way of um, uh, reflecting philosoph philosophically. So it is a sort of joint venture between the will to see and the will to think. And the, the two the two things, the two threads are linked there inside and embedded inside this book. Yes, well, you had just about the best education that can be obtained at the Lycée Louis Le Grand and then the Ecole Normale Supérieure. But you say in your book, you didn't want to be a professor. I bet a lot of your classmates became professors. Did you know very early on that this was not for you? Yeah, I, I, I did not know exactly what was for me. I did not have any idea of uh, what I will do all, the, all my life. And if I had an idea, it would not have been worth living it, of course. It is worth living if you don't know, if it is unexpected. But what I knew is that I would not be I will uh, just a professor that I will not spend all my life sitting in my library, that I will not um, um, uh, be just an academic. I have been an academic. I know how to do that. I have the 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 necessary scholarship, and as you said, uh, 
I did, the education. I did mm. more or less the best that can be possible as a student for that. But I wanted to escape that. It was not sufficient for me. You care a lot about what we used to call the third world. I don't know if that phrase is used anymore. And I want to ask why. And I want to say that a lot of people don't like this so much. Westerners caring about others. Edward Said made almost a whole career denouncing such a thing in his battles with Bernard Lewis and so on. What do you have to say about this, sir? What I say that for me is not even a question. I am a universalist. I am an internationalist. I, I care for the world. It's not even an effort for me. It's natural. It is the way I'm built. It is the way I'm shaped. And since um, the me beginning too, of my life, there is one thing. There is one thing which I hate which is egoism, which is uh, being uh, uh, enclosed in one's boundaries, which is being uh, uh, enclosed in one's uh, intimate fortress. I hate that. So I'm the contrary of it. And for me, it is an evidence to go to the world. It's an evidence. Well, you are singing my song, as we say here in America. Well. You, Monsieur, are several things. You are French, you are European, you are Jewish, and you are human, etc. Do you have a certain hierarchy or order? You know, everyone is obsessed with identity these days. All these identities you have in which you discuss in your book, is there an order, a, a, a prioritization of those things? No, because my, my, the idea I have of my identity and of your identity and, and of the identity of anyone is something moving, something changing, uh, uh, being uh, enriching itself, getting more and more rich and more complex and sometimes more simple, but certainly not stiff. So there are moments of my life and of my day where I feel more European than French. There are moments where I feel more Jewish, than, more Jew than anything else. There are some moments where I feel pro-American more than, than, <laughs> than uh, European. It really, the wealth of a human being, the complexity of a human mind is to be able to have a, a flexible and moving identity made, of course, with uh, stable stuff. It is always the same components, but they are not organized at every moment in the same way. When I'm reading uh, a page of Talmud, I'm a Jew. When I'm in uh, Mogadishu, Somalia, I am, uh, um, by heart and spirit, uh, an American brother of the um, American soldiers tortured and martyrized uh, uh, 25 years ago, uh, when I, and so on and so on. So the idea of having um, uh, uh, the identity such as the way I define it is precisely to be able to say that there, there is no priority. Ladies and gentlemen, we are speaking with Bernard-Henri Lévy, like Bernard Henry Levy, BHL. I'm Jay Nordlinger doing Q&A. His new book is The Will to See, back after this word from our sponsor, Ladder. Is life insurance on your list? Something you need to get? Life insurance is on a lot of lists. Time to cross it off, maybe. It makes sense, life insurance does, especially term coverage, which is surprisingly affordable. Why not pay a bit each month for the protection that life insurance affords? Choose Ladder, L-A-D-D-E-R. Ladder is 100% digital, no doctors, no needles, no paperwork, when you apply for $3 million in coverage or less. You need just a few minutes and a phone or laptop to apply. 
latter smart algorithms work in real time, so you'll find out instantly if you're approved. If you prefer to talk to a person, their team of licensed agents doesn't work on commission, so they'll help you and not upsell you. No hidden fees, cancel any time. Get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. And latter policies are issued by insurers with long proven histories of paying claims. They're rated A and A plus by AM Best. Finally, since life insurance costs more as you get older, now's the time to cross it off your list. Go to ladderlife.com slash QA today to see if you're instantly approved. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash QA. Ladderlife.com slash QA. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Q&A. I'm Jay Nordlinger, speaking with a French philosopher, writer, adventurer, and so on. He is BHL Bernard-Henri Lévy. You write very movingly in your book about your father. And I want to read something for the benefit of our listeners, something from the book. This is something entered into the military record of Mr. Lévy's father. It says this, André Lévy, ambulance driver and stretcher bearer, always ready and willing, day or night, whatever the mission, carried out evacuations under mortar fire with total disregard for his own personal safety, returning several times to search for the wounded on lines, then under intense enemy fire. This refers to World War II, July 1944, the taking of Monte Cassino. This is Mr. Lévy's father, André Lévy. And you have remembered this in key moments. So this man had an influence on your life, one can see. He was my, my father, but he was also my hero, and he was my model. And uh, in key moments of my life, when I was uh, stuck in a mountain of uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, just uh, holding myself by a rope, and I, and I was sort of afraid, I thought of the, you just quoted. When I was in the Ukrainian trenches uh, for night and days in front of the pro-Putin separatist with heavy shelling over the head of my, um, my escort and of course of, of me again, I had this sentence of my, about my heroic father and about his courage in my mind. And this sentence helped me to hold on, helped me to, to be strong, helped me not to be afraid, helped me to continue. You write something in your book that brought me up short, because I think of you as a man of boundless optimism, energy, possibility. You seem to me always sort of 28. And you write this in your book. On these adventures, meaning the trips and forays you've had recently, I have left behind a share of my energy and health. This has been pretty hard living, has it not? Yes, but I have a such, I have such a sweet living uh, on the other side. When I'm, in, when, when I'm in Paris, when I'm in New York, I'm so lucky. I have so many privileges. I, have, I am surrounded by such a great family and great friends that I can have these hard times, uh, these moments uh, more hard. It is like a, like a tax which happiness has to pay to, to, to destiny. And I do that with a light heart. Well, talking with you, I've remembered something that Claude Levi-Strauss said. At least it was attributed to him. He said, when I'm in Paris, I think of the Amazon. And when I'm in the Amazon, I think of Paris. 
Is there any of that in you? When you're at home, do you think of abroad? And when you're abroad, do you think of home? No, no. When I'm abroad, I, I'm abroad. And when I'm at home, I, I'm well. I am not, I'm not unstable. I'm just ready for um, an adventure of thought, an adventure of philosophy, or an adventure of witness and of uh, testimony. I'm just ready. If uh, a great magazine or newspaper ask me, are you ready to go to Mogadishu? Or are you ready to go to Af Panjshir, Afghanistan to meet the son of Masood? You knew the father, are you ready to, to use your connection in order to see the son? I say, I'm ready. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not longing for it. No, I'm where I am. I'm not longing for it, but I'm ready for it. So US forces, NATO forces withdrew from Afghanistan in August. I wonder if that sickened you, the denouement there, not for the Afghans because they are living under hell now, but this ending for the US and NATO forces. Were you disgusted, morally, politically, otherwise? I was sad. I was more than disgusted, I was sad. Sad for America, sad for the West. It was such a stupid move, an unstrategic move. It was absurd. This way in which your president, President Biden, uh, did by the plan of his predecessor, President Trump. It was an absurdity. There was no strategic need. And on the contrary, there is such, um, it is such a moral defeat for the West, such a loss of credibility. Uh, it is a, such a, um, a disaster for all of us that I am sad more than disgusted. I want to jump around the globe a little bit with you. Uh, there's a phrase in America, you especially hear it in evangelical circles, to have a heart for something. Uh, so and so has a heart for service. Uh, you have a heart for Ukraine, among other countries, because you have a heart for liberal democracy and people struggling against illiberalism. I wonder whether you think Ukraine will make it as an independent, sovereign democracy. Make it meaning survive, last as one. For the moment, they survive very bravely. Um, if I compare the situation which I saw a few months ago, which you have in the book, with what I saw six or seven years ago is better. The Ukrainian army is more strong. The spirit is more high. The spirit is higher. The, um, the will for Europe and the will to be rooted in the West has not uh, weakened at all. Uh, so in this time, they make it, they are making it, but of course, they have in front of them one of the worst, the worst illiberal statesman on earth, who is Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is, is not just the Hungarian Viktor Orban. He is the master of the illiberal. He is the head of the very strong army. He has an, a total absence of scruple. So Ukraine, be, despite its bravery, despite its uh, valiance, if they are left alone in front of Putin and of Russia, maybe the, they, uh, they will not make it. So we have to help them to be faithful to our values. We have to support them in their beautiful and smart embracement of our own creed. They believe in us, we have to support that. 
moving to another country, maybe the saddest, worst on earth, along with North Korea. I have to tell you, Monsieur Lévy, that I have a very hard time speaking of Syria, even thinking about it, because, well, I'll tell you this. I remember when the deaths reached about 2,000 years ago. I thought, damn, that's a lot. Then it was 10,000, five digits. 10,000, that's a lot. That was only the beginning, barely the beginning. And it seems to me that no one else has lifted a finger. I have a very hard time speaking about this subject, although I've interviewed individual Syrian refugees and so on and told their personal stories. But on Syria, I'm almost speechless. But you are not, as evidenced in your book. I'm not totally speechless, no. And and more and even more important, maybe I try to help the Syrian resistance to speak. And I tried to in this book to collect their word. Uh, one of the great encounter of my of my life is the encounter with the the embodiment of the Kurdish Syrian resistance. Uh, General Maslum Kobane, in his bunker, searched by the drones of Ankara, uh, lonely, uh, close to despair, but still standing. And uh, I did connect him with the president of my country, President Macron, on a little cell phone. This is a great moment of my life. And um, I, I tried my best to break this loneliness of the Kurds and to break the indifference of our privileged people in the West regarding Syria. Mr. Levy, uh, should people like you and me who supported the intervention in Libya be embarrassed by our support given subsequent events? Should we repent I say no. What do you say? I repent about our non-involvement involvement in Syria. This is what I repent about. The non-involvement, the non-commitment, the non-intervention in Syria. This is the real failure and the real remorse of, it should be, the real remorse of our generation. The, the result of our non-intervention in Syria is much worse than the result of our intervention in Libya. Of course, uh, Libya uh, is not paradise. Maybe we, do, we did not do enough. Maybe we left too early. Maybe we, we, we thought that uh, uh, it, will be, it will be okay uh, uh, just by um, uh, making a, a military intervention, which is probably not enough, but it is not as terrible as what it is in Syria due to our non-intervention. Since we're skipping around, I want to move to Israel and tell you something personal. It may be right, it may be wrong. I'm less worried than I once was about the survival of Israel. I think Israel, for all of its chaotic internal politics and for the great threat of Iran, I think Israel's looking relatively stable. What's your present feeling? I think that, first of all, of course, stability, but this I never really doubted. When you have a great people, with a vibrant democracy, with a high level of political requirement in most of the population, it's okay. It's okay. It's not, uh, again, you can have crisis and so on, but it's okay. The real good news for Israel is the change in the international um, environment. I mean, what is called the Abraham Agreements. The, the peace 
with a, a bunch of Arab countries in the area, with first of all Emirates, with Bahrain, with Morocco. This is a huge news for someone of my generation. My first trip in Israel, it was in 1967, the last day of the war of six days. I was then again in Israel nearly every time that there was a war. I was there as a reporter, reporter. I was there as a friend. I was there as a witness, whatever. Someone who has all these souvenirs, all these memories of Israel, you cannot imagine his relief, my relief, when I see these Abraham agreements. It changes everything. It is a Copernican revolution. It's a, it's a complete uh, change in the, in the order of the world in this part of the world. Is it possible to say that this is the best result of the Trump administration in Washington? Yes, certainly. Uh, no, you you can never you can never say about uh, about anyone that everything is uh, is um, uh, enlightened or that everything is black. It's dark, it's dark. And the Trump administration has this credit, yes. Credit to have uh, uh, willed and pushed and patterned in part these agreements. You had also, of course, the Israelis, you had the Emirates who did a lot, MBZ, uh, Ambassador Youssef Aloteba, you have a some uh, great gentlemen in Emirates who who planned all of that. But of course, the uh, uh, Trump administration has to be credited for that, yeah. And I'm not a partisan of Trump, as you know. Ladies and gentlemen, we are hearing from Bernard-Henri Lévy, whose new book is The Will to See. I am Jay Nordlinger doing Q&A, back after this word from our sponsor, X-Chair. When you sit in an X chair, your body says, ah, so this is what an office chair can feel like. You actually look forward to sitting in your office when you have an X chair. Can your current office chair give you a massage while you're working? X chair can. Can your current office chair heat up or cool down? X chair can. It's all in the LMX massage and temperature regulation exclusively designed and made for X-Chair. And once you feel the customized support of X-Chair's patented dynamic variable lumbar, or DVL, your back may never be happy in any other chair again. High performance, quality engineering, extreme comfort. Look, even when you're not working, you may want to sit in your X-Chair just to get that feeling. I recommend that you try X-Chair for yourself risk-free for 30 days. Chances are you'll never go back. This is what you do. Go to xchairqa.com. That's the letter X, chairqa.com. Or call 1-844-4X-CHAIR for $100 off your order. X-CHAIR has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 a month. XchairQA.com. Welcome back, my friends, to q and I'm Jay Nordlinger speaking with Bernard-Henri Lévy, who is at home in Paris. Mr. Lévy, you are a French patriot, that's clear. You've also been the target of considerable anti-Semitism in your life. I wonder, whether the anti-Semitism has ever shaken your patriotism, has ever caused your patriotism to falter? No, because I know that uh, regarding the Jews and probably more generally, there are two Frances, two France. Uh, there is a, a dark France, and there is a luminous France. 
And um, even when uh, anti-Semitism is uh, roaring, when it is raging, when it is, uh, um, when it seems to overwhelm um, uh, the public opinion, I know that there is a remaining, there is a flame which never uh, dies of, um, of uh, goodwill, of um, uh, greatness in, uh, in, in France. And this keeps me hoping. And you know, even during the darkest time, even in the Dreyfus affair, during the time of the Dreyfus affair, even in the time of uh, uh, the th uh, the 30s of the 20th century, even in the darkest time under French fascism, you had a resistance. You had uh, a free France. You had free fighters of free France who kept who kept the flame burning. And in my moments when I doubt, I never despair because I think of this burning flame of the real France, the true France, which is a France of ID, ideal France. You are a friend of the United States, an admirer of the United States, like Frenchmen before you, including Tocqueville. Uh, before him, we had a lot of help from a man named Lafayette. There are many towns in America called Lafayette. Um, as a friend, are you worried about the condition and soul of American democracy, American culture, American society. A lot of people are alarmed. I have days of alarm. Again, uh, I am alarmed. I am concerned because I see so many bad omens on the left and of the, on the right. Uh, the cancel culture on one side the America first on the other side, but same reply as what I said about France, mm. the American creed, the American exceptionalism, the American belief to be not just another nation, but uh, a great democracy remains and keep me hoping. And I know that even in the darkest moments of your history, you American people keep faithful to this American creed and American darkness, a uh, greatness, greatness. I have no doubt about that. So I'm concerned, but again, it's great expectation and hope. There are some fighting words in America, especially on the right some incendiary words. America is an idea that will start a great fight. And you have a very interesting passage in your book when you say America is an idea, but not only an idea, also a piece of ground. I wonder if you'd like to discuss that now, an idea and a piece of ground at the same time. A piece of ground and an idea. A piece of ground, all countries are a piece of ground. America is one of the very few countries in the world. Uh, Israel is another one. France is another one, which is also an idea, which is also a core of values, a core of principles. When the founding fathers of America created America, it was, of course, uh, because of a ground, but it was most importantly because they had with them in their luggage, in their chest, an idea of the world, an idea of Europe, uh, which they wanted to replant, to regrow, to recreate in a new ground. But what is what comes first with America is the idea. And this is what lives forever. This, this is what cannot be uh, taken from the, the citizens' spirits and the American uh, brains, hearts, and minds. 
Well, as you know, right now in my country and in other countries in the West, populism and nationalism are stirring or raging. And I'd like to ask you two questions in this fashion. Do you have any patience for nationalism? Do you have any patience for populism? Patience, uh, yes, because uh, um, things take, it, it takes time to convince uh, your fellow human beings of something, but I have no indulgence. I think that nationalism is a real uh, plague. I think that populism is a real disaster. Mm. I think that it can only lead a people to, to, to its own loss and to misery and sooner or later to chaos. I think that populism is the contrary, the opposite of, um, of people of people's rule and of democracy. So patience, yes, because it's, it might take time to, to convince, but indulgence, no. There is no, no nothing to, 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 to compromise with regarding uh, populism. Well, toward the end of our conversation here, I wanna ask you about some intellectuals. Because where I live on the American right, two dirty words are Derrida and Foucault, not to mention Sartre. At the same time, I have a French conservative friend, an intellectual, who says there is great worth in Derrida and Foucault, great worth. And Americans ought to spend some time on them. And I'm speaking of your teachers. And uh, I wonder whether you are largely sympathetic to these men or whether you think that these are people good can be drawn from, whether we embrace them fully or not. They were my, my, my masters, my teachers and my masters. Uh, I remain um, uh, faithful to them as I'm faithful to my youth and to the young man I was, I think that they are probably the last real great thinkers, great philosopher, at least of the continental philosophy in the last uh, 50 years. So uh, I cannot uh, negate, I cannot deny, I cannot turn my back to all of that. And uh, of course, I don't endorse everything. Uh, of course, there are things which I discussed when they were alive and I which still discuss uh, now that they are not here any longer. It's a silent discussion, but I keep on, I continue discussing it. But what I must say is that I know what you're alluding to. The work uh, current in America the cancel culture, the identity politics. The only thing I can say is that they understood nothing in Derrida and in Foucault. The deconstructionism, debuilding, de deconstructionism, which I know is very uh, up, uh, up to date in the, in, the, in the American campuses, it has nothing to do with what is, what is understood in the, in the uh, American universities. It's, so, it's, it's much more complex. It's much more sophisticated than just this idea that we have to unbuild and to build in another way the, 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 the sexual practices and so on. This interpretation of uh, uh, deconstructionism of Derrida, it's just so, so absurd. About Michel Foucault, I would like to come back one minute to what we said, we said at the beginning of our conversation about identity. Uh, Foucault has nothing to do with identity politics. Foucault has nothing to do with uh, um, uh, uh, building some safe spaces where you cannot be uh, embarrassed by the, speak, by the, the thinking of another one. 
this is so opposite to what Michel Foucault thought. It is again such a misunderstanding. So I would only, I would just like to say that that this invocation of Foucault and Derrida by some new currents of American uh, politics are based on a, a very strange misunderstanding. And I would like to go to some campuses, maybe to 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 deliver uh, uh, um, to, to speak about the real philosophy and the true thinking of Jacques Derrida and of Michel Foucault. The uh, American campuses would be probably very surprised <laughs> by by that. Well, here at the end, I want to ask you about a typical day in your life. I mean, when you're at home in Paris, and this is what I imagine, and you tell me how far off I am. I imagine that you rise fairly late, have a leisurely breakfast over newspapers, uh, maybe have a walk, meet with friends, talk, debate. And I picture in the late afternoon or at night, lots and lots of reading, gorging yourself in books. Tell me the real story. What's a typical day if there is a typical day? There is no real typical day. It depends if I'm uh, working on a book or not working on a book. It depends of my degree of uh, tension. When I'm finishing a book, a book, I'm in a completely different mood than when I am thinking of a future book and so on. What I can just say is that I never wake up late. <laughs> ah. <laughs> no, no. I wake up very early in the morning. Um, uh, number one, number two, I read and work most of the uh, most of the time, most of the day, most of the night. Uh, I I see some friends, of course, and my family, but um, I uh, I'm not so much distracted by the society around me i'm really living as an um, as a scholar well, uh, do, do you have a friend do you have a friend with whom you can argue profitably i'm going to read something uh, from your book this touched me this is what bernard levy says i pity anyone who has not experienced the heavenly gift of a true friend an eternal friend a friend as transparent as water from a rocky stream. Do you have such a person at present? Yeah, it is the man whom I describe in this uh, part of the book, which you just quoted so, so charmingly. His name is Gilles Herzog. He is my, my best friend, my... Um, my brother in arms, when we go with whom I go reporting uh, since uh, 40 years, hmm. uh, he follows me. I follow him in the in the um, dangerous areas of Ukraine or of Somalia, and uh, and I have with him this crystal clear relationship which you just uh, uh, evoked. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Jay Nordlinger for Q&A, whose producer is Madeline Osborne. The sponsors of this episode are Ladder and X-Chair. He is Bernard-Henri Lévy, whose latest book is The Will to See, Dispatches from a World of Misery and Hope. What a pleasure to speak with you, sir. And I look forward to the next time and to your next adventures and next writings. Thank you.
Ricochet. Join the conversation.